Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We'll begin our Bible study in just a moment. Uh, If you'd like to open up to Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 15, you can do so. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties, but was able to get it up and running. So, um, but no, if you'd like to open up to Mark chapter 14, that'll be what we look at today. Mark chapter 14. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our Bible study this morning as we continue our race with Jesus to the cross and have a chance in Mark 14 to look at the institution of the Lord's Supper um, and also Jesus' arrest. Uh, It's an opportunity for us to consider what what a defining moment that this this was for the New Testament church for us um, to this day that the high point of our church here is is Holy Week ultimately culminating in Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead and today we'll have an opportunity to talk about that Um, and it's no coincidence that takes place uh, on a similar defining moment for the Israelites the the celebration of the Passover that's kind of the opening question I'd like you to ask yourself about Um, if you think about it for a second what was the defining moment for you in your life Um, And what would you call a defining moment for us in our culture? Uh, You know, if you give that a little bit of thought, I think sometimes it's hard in the moment to realize how that moment affects us and how it shapes us. And maybe the coronavirus will be something that that certainly will... uh, kind of affect us and our generation. Uh, whether it lasts for generations down the line, you know, it kind of remains to be seen. Uh, but it's interesting how these events, how they kind of stamp their imprint on their life and our psyche and just affect the way that we look at life. I've been reading a book in, entitled American Nations. Uh, it's written by a guy who has the idea that, that really our country is not broken up by state lines, but broken up according to these 11 nations in the country. And, and all of them um, are defined differently. They have different ideals. They have different values and it's part of the reason we have some of the culture clashes we have in our country and it's interesting because he traces all of it back to the beginning and he says those initial moments when that part of the country was settled with those people that emigrated from the places they emigrated from they put into place a culture that that continues to affect the way we look at life today and if you think of how that works with the israelites i don't think you can overstate that reality For the Israelites, the Passover was the defining celebration of the defining moment of their history. I mean, that was a day when the Lord showed that that they were his promised people. As he marched them out of Egypt with the Egyptians giving them all their silver and gold, with that great country reduced to ruins by the ten plagues, there, you know, the Apostle Paul would, would say that they passed through the water of the Red Sea and that was their baptism. That, that was the beginning of their life, their understanding that they were the people of God. And so celebrating that went to the core of who they were. It was their identity. And Jesus uses that as an opportunity to celebrate for us or to institute for us something that goes to the core of our identity, the Lord's Supper. And really everything that happens and what we're going to look at today goes to the core of who we are as Christians. From Jesus giving us his own body and blood and the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper to Jesus ultimately offering that, that body and blood as a payment for your sin and mine. Today we'll have an opportunity to consider how that really goes to the very core of who we are as Christians. We'll begin by considering Mark chapter 14, uh, verse 12 to 16. So if you want to look at Mark chapter 14, verse 12, that'll be the first thing that we look at. If you'd like to follow along, we'll talk about it. It says, On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice a Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room so I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He'll show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Before we consider, before we continue, just for a moment consider why Jesus does it this way. I mean, he could have just made the reservations himself. He could have set it up in advance. 
Why send them in to meet somebody who just happens to be carrying a jar of water by? See, Jesus is showing them something about himself. He is the Son of God. He sees all and he knows all. And if he knew that person would be carrying that jar of water, if he knew that that person would have an upper room ready for them, well, then certainly he knows that, that Judas would betray him. Certainly he would know um, that he'd be put on trial, that he'd be condemned to death. You see, this is Jesus' last night with the disciples, his last chance to talk to them face-to-face -face the way he, he had gotten used to talking to them and training them. After the resurrection from the dead, everything changes. And so you, you don't waste words. Everything has meaning in that kind of a situation. You imagine you knew that, that today would be the last chance you'd have to talk to, to your husband, your wife, your kids, your, your neighbors, your best friend. Are you going to waste your time talking about sports? About whether or not the Packers did a good job with the draft? About the weather? Are you even going to talk that much about the coronavirus? I don't think I would. I think you'd reserve your words for what really matters, what's really important. Everything Jesus says, all of it, is so important for us to consider today because what he's telling them, what he's giving them, is something that, that you and I continue to have to this very day. Before he gives them that Lord's Supper, he talks about what is going to happen to one of their own. And it's something that's going to be go to the core of what we're going to see through the rest of the chapter, that the danger that you and I live in of falling away, of rejecting our God. We continue reading from Mark 14, beginning at verse 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It's one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Once again, Jesus shows them that, that there are no surprises. That he saw all of this coming. That he knows where this night would end, where it would lead to the cross. And ultimately to the empty tomb. And he, that he also knew that Judas would be the one who would betray him. And what a sad story it is for Judas. He had come to know Jesus so well. All that time, his teaching, his miracles, he had a front row seat to learning from the Son of God, God himself. And yet, he rejected him. Sold him for 30 pieces of silver for nothing. Because Jesus didn't live up to his expectations. For whatever reason. Because greed infected his heart. Whatever the case, he pushed Jesus away. What a sad thing. And as Jesus tells the disciples about it, I want you to notice something that we're going to see contradicted in the next couple of verses. He says, one of you will betray me. Do you see what the disciples say back? They say, surely not I. You know, later Peter is going to be overconfident. Say, even if everyone else betrays you, I never will. But here, one by one, the disciples ask, is it me? You see, from that, I think there's a godly understanding that my sinful nature means that I'm capable of the worst kinds of evil. There's nothing more dangerous than for a Christian to have faith just in themselves, in the power of their own faith, and their own ability to, to fight off temptation. It's nothing but pride. And it's so often confused with faith. But in the end, it, that lets you down. Because if you and I look to ourselves to save ourselves, all we see is a problem. All we see is death. All we see is sin. It's in Jesus that we find salvation. We find hope. We find assurance. We continue reading in Mark 14, continuing at verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, 
He went out to the Mount of Olives. It was Jesus last night with the disciples. And so what does he do? He gives them a way that, that they can still have that, that close connection with him that, that they had come to treasure over all their time with him. The very price of, this, of the cost of the sins of the world, the body and blood of the Son of God, given to the disciples, given to you and I. It's a miracle. We can't begin to understand. I have no idea how God does it. But we don't have to understand it. We don't have to explain it. It's not our miracle to perform. It's his. And the reason for it is clear. If love wants to be near its object, then how much closer could Jesus get? He feeds you his very self, his own body, his own blood, for the very thing it came to win, the forgiveness of your sins. To take away all that separates you from God and, and making you close to him. You know, there are a few things among Christians that we treasure as highly and that at times can, can be as controversial as a celebration of the Lord's Supper. And that comes back to the fact that this is such a precious gift. For a moment, just consider this question. Consider how the coronavirus restrictions have affected our celebration of the Lord's Supper. What tensions exist as we seek to use this gift? I know here at St. Matthew's, we hope to soon be able to get together for worship and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper with one another. And with the different restrictions that we are experiencing, we're going to have to find some ways maybe of being creative and doing that. But I think there's always a line you walk, huh? I mean, the Lord's Supper isn't the only way that God interacts with his people. He comes to us in his word. He comes to us in the waters of baptism. But that doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean we shouldn't hunger for it. We shouldn't strive to find ways to enjoy and to use that gift. But as we do so, we don't want to also treat it as though it's something common, something ordinary. Nothing more than just crackers and grape juice. To do so is to dishonor the gift that God has given us. And so there's this tension we walk as Christians. On the one hand, understanding what a high gift it is and wanting to partake of it and yet wanting to treat it in a way that's respectful. I think this maybe has been one of the hardest parts for Christians of the coronavirus, not being able to gather together, not being able to receive Jesus' body and blood and the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. And yet remember, it's only a foretaste of heaven, that one day the Lord's going to take us to be with him forever, where you and I will be with him face to face for all of eternity. We'll continue reading in, in Mark 14. And before we do so, we'll consider this question. Self-reliance is commonly confused with faith. Can you think of some examples of that confusion and why that's dangerous? Do you ever think of that? I tell you that sometimes what makes me most scared for people is when I hear people say something to, along the lines of, don't worry, Pastor, I'm strong in my faith. I've been a member of this church for so and so many years. I've done this for so and so many years. I've been involved in this or that way. I've given this. I've accomplished that. See, none of those are reasons not to worry. Because none of that is what faith is. Faith isn't the compilation of all the things that we've done for Jesus over the course of our, our life. And faith isn't stronger because we managed to be a member of an organization for a certain amount of time. Now, faith is a miracle only God works. And a miracle that, that he chooses to work through the power of his word and through the power of baptism. A miracle that he continues to, to strengthen in us through the power of God working in his word in the Lord's Supper and through the continued remembrance of our baptisms. It's in those means that God strengthens us and draws us closer to himself. Anytime we tell ourselves that we're free from temptation because of something else, whatever it is, it's not faith. It's overconfidence. Today we're going to see in, in our next verses the overconfidence of Peter, of many of the disciples, and we'll get to see where it led. We continue reading in Mark chapter 14. You'll all fall away, Jesus told them, for it's written, I will strike the sheep and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. 
I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. And all the others said the same. Can you hear it? Peter's faith in his faith. How sure he was that even if everybody else abandoned Jesus, he never would. Peter's confidence wasn't found in a God who saves. It wasn't found in the promises God had given him and the kinds of things that faith is meant to sink its teeth into. Peter's faith was found in his own self-confidence, his own self-reliance, his own strength. And at some point, that's always going to let you down. You know, what Jesus quotes is Zechariah 13. And for a moment, just look at that passage. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against a man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I'll turn my hand against the little ones. And the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They'll call on my name, and I will answer them. I'll say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is our God. Peter had this idea in his head that he was just going to march triumphantly on. That even if everyone else abandoned Jesus, he would just be all spit and vinegar. Kind of like those old uh, World War II films that you'd see, the black and whites, where the hero is always happy and and excited and everything's always going well. That's not life. When Jesus quotes Zechariah 13, he quotes what the Christian life is. About how oftentimes there's just a remnant. There's just some. And so many reject the truth, and so many abandon, and so many walk away from the faith. Two-thirds, he says. But that one-third, which isn't meant to be a specific number, but just a picture of of that idea of, of, of a remnant, that God saves some, even as he died for the entire world. That, that one third will be refined, it will suffer, it will struggle, but in the end, he will strengthen us. What an important thing it is to remember today, huh? That all the struggle God sends in our life, all the problems that we endure, he sends to strengthen us, to refine us, so that we can unequivocally answer that question, the Lord is our God, as Zechariah speaks about Zechariah 13. We'll see in a second where Peter's overconfidence leads, the same place it often leads us. We'll continue reading in Mark 14. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Yet take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. There Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he has these precious moments to prepare himself for what he's about to endure. And and he wants companionship. He wants the disciples to stay up with him. I mean, sure, he can pray alone just as well as he can pray if they're sitting there. But I mean, isn't that something you and I experience too? I mean, we're made to live with each other, to live in communion, a connection with one another. No one wants to be alone. Jesus understands that. Jesus experienced that. He wanted the disciples to stay up with him. And yet, as he goes off to pray, he finds that this is something he will do alone, on his own, which he knew, which has always had to be. And yet, I think his prayer is an important one for us to emulate. Not my will, 
but yours be done. How often you and I go into God's throne room barking out orders this way and that, but not Jesus. He goes to his heavenly Father. He lays before him the situation he's facing. Asks if there's any other way. Can we do that? But finally, submits himself to the will of his heavenly Father. And what was God's answer to his prayer? It wasn't to remove the cross. The cross had to be there. If you and I are to be close to God, someone had to pay for sin, and Jesus was the one. But he strengthened him. Empowered him to face what he would face. So that before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, even as his hands and feet are nailed to the cross and the life leaves his body, even as he's crushed for your sin and mine, he would suffer this willingly for you and for I. Now we see the people approach Jesus in the garden. He continues. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is a man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They receive the sad episode when Judas, a trusted friend, approaches Jesus and greets him with a kiss, a sign of his betrayal. And as they come, notice how everyone reacts. They panic. Someone reaches out and they strikes the, the ear, hits the ear off of one, one of the priest's servants. And everyone runs. But there Jesus stands. He had been prepared for this. He went to the cross willingly. And now the time had come for him to do what the Passover lamb had always pointed ahead to, to offer his life for your sins and mine. The first interaction we see is his trial before the Sanhedrin in Mark chapter 14. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave him false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this man-made temple, and in three days we'll build another not made by man. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before the men and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And all the guards took him and beat him. There we see him, completely alone. And that solitude must have been emphasized by who it was that was attacking him. Here he was called before the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body of the people, the church. And what happens? Those religious leaders of the people are, are bent on condemning the Son of God to death, sure, positive of his innocence. They bring in false witnesses, people that tell lies about Jesus, but they can't even get their story straight, an obvious reality of lying. And the high priest himself, he asks a question that goes right to the jugular. Are you the son of God? Are you the blessed one? 
And Jesus answers honestly. The high priest doesn't take time to consider whether or not Jesus' claim might be true. He doesn't do what the Old Testament commands to compare the person claiming to be the Christ to the prophecies. Instead, he already has in mind the verdict he wanted. And now he finds his way to give it. There Jesus says, with the people who were supposed to be the religious leaders of the people. And yet they reject them. And outside in the courtyard is Peter. And there is Peter, the one who said, even if everyone else abandons you, I never will. And we get a chance to see where that self-reliance leads. We continue in Mark 14, verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is where that leads. This is where faith and faith always takes us. Faith in our own strength, our own ability, our own whatever. Peter was so confident, so sure that he would be able to pass the test, so sure that even if everyone else abandoned him, he would. And, and what happens? Before the testimony of a servant girl, before her inquiry, he buckles under the pressure, denies ever knowing Jesus. In the end, he, he runs out and weeps bitterly. And once again, there is Jesus, alone, and there also is our hope. You see, Jesus went to that cross alone because he was the one who came to save us. And he took our sin and our guilt and our death and there he nailed it to the cross to die along with him and left it behind when he walked out of the tomb. As we see Jesus' trial, as we look next time at his crucifixion, we see the death of all that we hate about ourselves, all that we regret, all that we've forgotten about, all of our sin. And when Jesus walks out of that tomb, we see forgiveness, freedom from sin, and eternal life. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The disciples fled into the woods. They failed. And how many times haven't we failed him? And Jesus walked that road to the cross alone, but he did that to save you and I. Thank you for joining us for our Bible study today. Next time we'll have an opportunity to look at Jesus' crucifixion in Mark 15. Uh, Lord's blessings on the rest of your week.